Education and conservation are evidently the driving force behind our snake heroes of Southern Africa. In this episode, we will find out how they are forging a path for snake conservation in Southern Africa and setting an example for the rest of the world. We also find out how they have created careers for themselves involving snakes in one way or another. And we will also find out the dangers of working with venomous snakes and what methods our snake heroes have used to mitigate this. Soon after school, I had, a, I had a career in the police and I was a drug squad cop and I had this really keen interest on reptiles. And I met uh, Fritz Miller, who had just bought Fitzsimmons Snake Park. Managed to get a job with him. It was going to be a short-term thing prior to me going and doing some studies. Um, and during that time, I met Rod Patterson, owner of Transvaal Snake Park, who offered me a job there. So I moved up to, um, to Halfway House and uh, I was there for the next three years and got very involved in herpetology, uh, really enjoyed it, left the park, uh, wrote my first book, Snake vs. Man, about the age of 24. And um, soon thereafter, I got involved with crocodile farming for the next eight years. So I farmed crocodiles all over the country for the next eight years. But I always had the, the reptile interest in the background. I wrote a few more books um, and always kept in touch with other herpetologists, got to know the likes of Bill Branch and uh, you know Dr. Don Broadley and all the big names. And it sort of just grew from there. I respond to emergency snake complaints. So if somebody finds a snake in their garden or their house or somewhere inconvenient, their workplace, they can call me and I'll pop through and then, then catch the snake safely uh, and then relocate it into a safe area. Also involved with that is I do a lot of education for, for people. So I don't just walk in, catch a snake and walk out. Well, not, not if I can help it. So I walk in, catch a snake and then explain to the people what the snake was. Tell them a bit about it, why it's here. Have a look at their garden, explain to them this is why you're getting snakes in your garden. I'm a professor of herpetology and I'm in the School of Animal, Plant and Environmental Sciences and I run a research lab so I've got about 15 postgraduate uh, students in the lab and a, a couple of postdocs and we focus most of our research on snake ecology, biogeography and evolution. My job is basically to run around and help people and help snakes. So. People have a problem snake in the garden or in the house or in their workplace, or wherever, and they don't like it there. Instead of killing the animal or trying to catch it themselves, they can call me up and I can go and assist, um, remove the snake safely and relocate it to somewhere more natural where the snake can continue with its life in peace uh, away from humans. Yeah, and I'm basically on 24 hour call out for that, so people can phone me at any time. And I'll drop what I'm doing and I'll go and assist. So in January 2000, I started doing snake training courses. Uh, at first it was just for um, general people, etc. It soon grew to include corporates. And uh, in 2005, I had my first outside of South Africa request and I went to do a snake training course for a mine in Mali, West Africa. And then from there it just grew and grew and grew. More mines in Africa needed my services. And uh, more mines in South Africa needed my services. And it just grew and grew and grew from there. And so today what I do is I supply the venom for the anti-venom unit, which is really a hobby. And I do snake related training for whoever needs it. The park was opened uh, approximately 50 years ago and um, it was opened by my, my father who had a, a fascination with animals and reptiles in particular as well. And um, I've been working at the park now for 24 years and uh, I've had huge fun in working here. It's been a, a different experience, it's not an office job, it's not a 9 to 5. We get to deal with a whole range of different uh, interesting things every day, it's never the same. Um, sometimes it can become a little bit tedious um, because a lot of it is routine work as well where you may need to make sure when you keep a reptile that you make sure it stays within optimum conditions. Some of them are very challenging. You have desert dwelling species requiring special habitats. You have uh, jungle species which require specialized jungle environments, high humidity, low heat temperatures. 
And uh, obviously, keeping reptiles in captivity is a, a challenge. Um, they are able to pick up diseases, so um, hygiene is very important. They can get internal parasites. They are capable of getting bacterial infections. These are some of the requirements one would have to keep your reptile collection in pristine condition. Snakes, which actually tend to get older, um, you're looking at your cobras, boas and pythons. Uh, a good snake uh, can get to an age of around 30, 35, 40 years old. Um, recently, we had one of our black mambas pass and on post-mortem, he actually died of congestive cardiac failure, which is an age-related disease and the snake was around 18 years of age. So he passed because of age. We keep um, indigenous South African reptiles, uh, venomous as well as non-venomous. Obviously we keep uh, mamba species, black and green, as well as some of the other African mamba species, various species of cobras, uh, which can be a problem to human beings, various adders, non-venomous species of snake, uh, harmless species like the African egg eater. So we have a number of different species of snakes. And basically our aim is to educate members of the public on what a reptile is there for. What does a reptile actually do? So we're in a position to actually go and show a person what a Mozambique spinning cobra looks like. Because in South Africa, a lot of people will say they see a snake making a hood, it has to be a runkos. So we have these animals and we can actually show a person what is the difference between a runkos and a Mozambique spitting cobra. Important facets, also for the medical community, we provide professional identification of the snake which has caused the problem. Uh, for instance, Often people are bitten by non-venomous species of snake, land up at a hospital or a doctor. Doctor needs to know what species of snake was involved here. Is it a dangerous species, not a dangerous species? And we can provide that sort of information to the medical community. The role of zoos is changing and has always been changing. And as anything in nature, there's never any stasis. There's always change. The nature of zoos is changing a lot, but the primary function of the zoo is to educate members of the public. And in our scenario, what we can actually do is show them what dangerously venomous reptiles actually look like. For instance, this morning, we had somebody come in who were convinced that they actually had caught a black mamba in their house. Bring it in, so immediately this person now can be shown and reassured and shown that this is what a black mamba looks like. The snake that you've actually caught was a sand snake. TVs are fantastic and they can provide you with a certain amount of information, but it doesn't give you the whole picture, possibly the sight, the smell, the sound, and actually physically possibly touching a snake can actually go a long way with actually dispensing of certain ideas, myths, and um, actually create something positive. Whereas with TV by itself, some generic instrument somebody is looking at, people lose focus, don't pay attention, and that's what happens. And this, we try and give a complete um, exposure in the sense of, uh, instead of just a partial, I'd rather look at things in depth than just looking at it uh, in one specific view. As, as soon as you see another human being physically interacting with an animal in a proper controlled way, you can already start changing minds. We've seen this numerous times with school kids where in the beginning, you maybe pull a snake out and everybody goes absolutely crazy, huge fear. Now you stop everybody and you explain to them exactly what you're doing and you slowly take the snake out and they see you standing there. The snake is nice and calm because he's being handled in the correct manner. Immediately, you have a huge impact. You're changing people's perceptions, changing people's ideas. This is extremely important. Zoos have that function. Um, it's what they've been doing for many years. In future, we'll see how it works out, how things change. But the biggest problem we're facing in the world at this point in time is overpopulation, habitat destruction, change, massive industrialization, urbanization. These are all important things that are actually affecting every single animal species around us, including the reptiles, including mammals. Um, how many people take cognizance of this? We've got a group of, I think about 20, 25 volunteers now that I've taught over the years who go around uh, rescuing problematic snakes. Um, we've got a little WhatsApp group and we will put it on the group. There's a, a snake bite, there's an emergency in such and such a town and whoever's available will then go and, and try and catch the snake. But even those people, those that are involved, 
are business people. They lawyers and doctors. Um, some people run their own businesses. So we don't have anybody that's just dedicated to to rescuing snakes. So I work for myself. I run my own program. It's called KwaZulu Natal Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. The purpose is just to um, save those animals, reptiles and amphibians, by educating people, by creating an awareness, helping people just to understand them better. Um, so I do snake removals, uh, which I try to use as education at the same time, and I do snake awareness talks at schools, companies, charities, events. I have a company called Enviro Insight with my partner Sam, and we do environmental services all over Africa, but focus a lot in South Africa where we do impact assessments and our, my primary focus during these, these sorts of projects is to, is to do a good biodiversity inventory of the, the land that we're surveying. But essentially then gathering knowledge on all the reptiles and amphibians um, in, the, in the particular area. And we utilize that information and make that information available to the public. And then probably some of my most recent work specifically with snakes involves taking photographs for a children's book that Johanna Ray from African Snake Bite Institute is, is busy with. Specialized uh, snake photography revolves around, you said, utilizing studio lights and a studio setup. And the reason why we're doing this particular shoot here is because we're trying to take um, interesting perspectives of snakes, specifically for kids, and we're using a white background here. So the, the um, uh, specialist Graphic designers can cut the snake out effectively from the from the background and then easily merge into a white page with and arrange text around it. I can't do any of this, uh, all of this on my own because the, the the camera lenses required are very specialized, and it's a uh, um, it's 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 really it's a full time job to just take the photo. So Ursula is assisting and always does assist with these um, shoots. Today we're actually photographing a rhombic or common egg eater. And it's a very charismatic animal because they've got a, a firstly, they're actually non-venomous. They don't even have teeth because they swallow whole eggs. But the, you hear it now, but the charismatic behavior they, they display is like a defensive behavior where they rub their scales against each other. In addition to that, they actually strike with a big open mouth, which looks very intimidating for potential predators, but is actually completely safe um, if you know the snake because uh, echidos don't even have teeth. They actually have no way of defending themselves physically, so they just put up this big show. Yeah, I think that's quite nice. I think we're done. Yeah. After a photo shoot, uh, we like to keep the um, non-venomous snakes in a pillowcase. The pillowcase works well because it provides a shelter for the snake. It's dark and it collapses on the snake's body, so the snake actually feels a bit comforted and feels well hidden and can recover from the photo shoot. For this sequence of photos, we're going to try and um, get a puff adder to feed on the, the stage platform to um, get a good look at the whole feeding mechanism from the front. So look at the snake's face while it's actually busy swallowing a mouse. Um, so we need to just be careful because this is a venomous snake, obviously and we have to handle them with care so as not to not to um, spook them too much and just slowly take the snake out and let it relax a little bit before we try the feeding This is a wide angle macro, and to get the snake head at one to one macro, in other words, fill the frame, you have to be really close, uh, but it also allows you to capture the rest of the, the image at the back. But the focal distance is very short, so um, it's a bit of a dangerous lens to use with venomous snakes, uh, which you'll see I have, a, I have a glove on my focusing uh, hand on my left hand, just as a bit of added protection, not that. One should ever use the glove exclusively for puffer bite protection, but in an instance where it would be a quick mistaken nip, 
I might get away with it. Just in case um, uh, things might get a little bit more dangerous, I've got the hook sticky on position also as additional protection for Luke's hand. Um, just basically as a, as a barrier. Usually after feeding, the snake is actually fixing its uh, teeth, putting its teeth back in position, which uh, often fantastic photographic opportunity. I'm going to pick up the snake with two hook sticks now because uh, I want to make the transfer a temporary um, holding chamber more comfortable and because she's just fed to the additional hook stick helps to stabilize her body so that, the, that she doesn't sag and simply one hook stick. We're heading through to a call out now in uh, the Hillcrest area in one of these housing estate complexes. Uh, a lady phoned and said that her staff have discovered a snake under their pool filter cover. Uh, I suspect it'll be a night adder. It's the most common snake we find in this area, especially this time of year. They eat frogs. Frogs are active and abundant right now. Uh, also, interestingly enough, it's the most common place that we find snakes uh, on call outs. So people lift up their pool filter cover and there's a snake quietly hiding there. My daily routine is certainly not your standard nine to five job. There are certain parts of it that are all routine, getting kids to school, fetching kids from school, uh, making dinner, making breakfast standard routine, things like that. So in, in some ways, I am a, uh, I am a, a normal person. But um, there's no saying what's going to happen call-out-wise. Snakes don't keep office hours. They don't have set times that they pop up in people's gardens or houses. So I can be just about to do something that I've planned, like building a cage for a client or building a racking system for a pet shop or about to do some shop fitting for somebody. And then I get the call that there's a snake in a garden. So we drop everything and we run because time is of the essence. You can't say to them, fine, I'll, I'll be with you in a matter of a few hours and hopefully the snake is still there because it won't be there. Hello, morning, morning. There we go, it's a herald snake. They can be quite feisty, but they, they're not venomous or not dangerous. Sometimes called a red-lipped herald, but this guy's got no red lips. See, they're pretty cool. Looks quite skinny, probably just laid eggs. It's a time of year that they do that. Okay, and quick and simple, we pop it in the bag and off we go. This looks like as good a spot as any. Nice bushy area. Sort of place where the snake could occur naturally. There we go, little guy. Off you go and have a nice life and go and eat some frogs. Snakes are venomous. Snakes are not poisonous. With What's my courses, I cover theory in the morning. Animal so we do a lot animal. of identification, safety, what does venom actually do if a snake bites you, and the best first aid to limit the damage or to give you time to get to a medical facility to get help. So we do the theory in the mornings and in the afternoons, I take the snakes out and I teach people how to help themselves to remove problematic snakes. Very often I have people who have just started join people that have already been trained. So they tag along and they learn from people who have already been successfully catching snakes. Okay, come closer. All right, the one that first Okay, so you want to touch him? See, he's got two on the one side. So the one's coming out and the other one's there. Here in Swaziland, we are far from medical facilities. So the emphasis should be on safety first. And the way that you can catch a snake safely is to have a buddy that, that's your wingman who helps you uh, with a call out. So I teach people to, to catch snakes in pairs and to always have somebody helping you. Um, if you've got a mamba and it's running around in a small confined area, the best thing is to have two people controlling the situation. If I grab it with a snake tong and something goes wrong and it slips out of my tong, somebody else can step in and help. It's much safer to deal with um, very venomous snakes if there's two people doing it. So my, my teaching is to rather go with a wingman, go with a buddy. Um, and if you don't have somebody to travel with you, is to find somebody who's at the, the, the site where the problematic snake is and to go through him, with him quickly. This is how you hold the lid and this is what I'd like you to do. To try and catch a, a three meter black mamba all by yourself 
manage the equipment, uh, manage the, the bucket. It takes a lot of experience and it's taken me many years to feel comfortable to go and, and double tongue a big black mama, but it takes a while to gain that experience. So President, I, I run the African Snack Bite Institute and uh, what we do is we um, do a lot of courses. We provide training in snake awareness, uh, snake handling, first aid for snake bite. We have advanced snake handling courses. I do a lot of lecturing to doctors, to uh, the Society of Travel Medicine, consult to the likes of the Tiger Bird Poison Centre, the Red Cross. So on our public courses, we get a lot of interested delegates from every walk of life, um, general hikers, bikers, fishermen, fly fishermen, anything like that. And they want to know more about snakes. So we start off with the awareness session in the morning. We cover myths and legends, behavior, identification, first aid for snake bite, all that sort of thing. In the afternoon <laughs> session, we go on and teach them how to handle venomous snakes using the correct equipment and the safest protocols. And this will allow them to, to hopefully remove and relocate snakes that they come across. We have a massive educational task. You know, we produce hundreds and hundreds of posters that we make available free. Uh, so we, we, we really have uh, quite a strong presence in the market. But it, largely it's all about education and a lot of the people that attend our courses are members of the public, but we also do a lot of corporate work all over Africa. So when it comes to the handling session, safety is the biggest factor for us. It's obviously if anybody's doing a removal, we want them to be as safe as possible while they're doing it. So uh, when we teach um, using hooks with puff adders, they only use hooks. There's no tailing or any of that sort of cowboy stuff that happens and um, they, they pick up a puffy mid-body with a hook, put it into a bucket or put it into a snake tube and uh, seal the lid. We had a course yesterday at uh, Pezulu in, uh, in the Valley of a Thousand Hills and we had a uh, place on uh, 40 people attending us. And uh, it's quite an intensive course because we share a great deal of information. I mean, the afternoon we teach them how to safely handle snakes using the right equipment. And the feedback that we get afterwards, the number of people that come up to us and say, this was like one of the best days of my life, or, I've had a lifelong fear of snakes and you've just changed my life and that is absolutely awesome. We teach delegates the, the advantages of using tongs and hooks on specific snakes and also teach them how to use the correct capturing techniques and equipment. So things like buckets and tubes where we know that they can safely secure a snake and transport it off site and release it again. The favourite part of what I do is the snake removals. I enjoy catching snakes out of people's homes. Uh, you know, it's such a great feeling when you catch a snake and, and watch it go free back into the bush away from people. It's also funny seeing how people react to snakes. Um, but yeah, you also try to use it as an educational lesson, really. Um, but it's a lot of fun, especially mamba calls and cobra calls, but black mamba calls are definitely my favorite, the most exciting. To see people come to a training class where they're absolutely terrified of snakes, some of them can't even look at a picture of a snake. They just want to close their eyes. And then at the end of the day, seeing them catching large 1.8 meter cobras, tailing the snake, hooking the snake, and a wide smile on their face. It is really a tremendous uh, satisfaction that I get from being able to train these people, to give them that skill, to over overcome those phobias that they have with snakes. And, uh, the other thing that really gives me a great satisfaction is to hear of a snake bite case where the doctor had some training from me, was faced with a case, successfully treated the case. All right, and that is really what gives me great satisfaction. So I really enjoy when um, I have a car full of snakes that have been rescued that we go and relocate and release. But I'm just as thrilled when I have a mamba victim arrive at the hospital um, terribly ill, uh, close to death. They get the anti-venom treatment um, and they walk away. I, I've been um, collecting funds for anti-venom since 2008. We probably save or buy enough treatment for about 50 snake bite victims in a season. I don't have much routine uh, because I'm on 24 hour call and I never know when that phone's going to ring. So I try not to have too much of a, a routine as such other than just getting up and getting ready 
and having some breakfast because when the calls start you just gotta run and go with it and sometimes you run around for the whole day without eating so I think that's the only thing I really need to plan <laughs> just to get up and get ready and be ready to roll if someone had to phone me. I think the most satisfying thing about my job is discovering new things, is learning. And I think that the job that I have is unique in the respect that one of my functions is to discover new things. And, and learning, I think, is what keeps my mind young and keeps me interested in the job. Um, so that would be it in a nutshell, I think. When somebody phones me, they tell me they've got a snake in the garden, they describe the snake to me, we can then ascertain what species it is, and they say to me, perfect, now I know what it is, I'm happy to leave it here. Then I feel my job is done. Um, now that comes long and slow because not everybody's happy to leave any snake in their garden. Um, but for me to, to know that I've, I've encouraged somebody to appreciate nature in their garden where I, I believe it should be, that to me is a favorite part. I love seeing snakes, I love catching snakes, but just to know that they can be where they should be makes me far happier than actually having the snake in the hand. My favorite part is uh Releasing, obviously, you get a really nice feeling. Um, you've taken the snake away from potential harm, um, from a, a busy area or a built up area, and you've taken it to a really nice, isolated, natural habitat where you know the snake is going to thrive, he's going to be happy, there's going to be nobody around to interfere, and letting that snake free and watching him uh, cruise off and disappear into the, into the bush, that's a very good feeling. The other very good feeling is when I catch pregnant snakes or gravid snakes um, and you know that they're pretty much ready to lay those eggs or give birth to those babies really soon. I'll hang on to them and let them have those babies or lay those eggs and yeah, it's awesome. Awesome to have um, yeah, baby snakes, they're just so cute, uh, especially the eggs, to watch the little eggs hatching and little babies sticking their little nose out the egg and taking their first breath and then being able to take all those babies and go put them back into the wild. Uh, it's a very good feeling, yeah, it's cool. The thing that really makes me feel good inside is if I get a message or a photograph from somebody who, whose name I've probably forgotten, who six months or a year before that had been bitten by a snake, were at death's doorstep, they took my advice and they sent me a photo of the child's first day at school or just something like that, that I think, well, at least I saved one person and that person can go have a happy life and possibly be a productive part of society just because of advice that I gave them. I think working with venomous snakes has its risk, but it depends on your approach. And uh, I have a very conservative approach to reptiles. Uh, I'm really careful with venomous snakes, try not to be blasé. So I'm certainly not a cowboy and that, I think that, you know, with, with snakes we see a lot of eager, a lot of guys want to show off and all of this sort of nonsense. Um, and yeah, in the last 40 years, I've had one minor mishap where uh, I had a puff had a bite through the, through the side of my boot. Fortunately, it wasn't uh, severe envenomation. I didn't need to have anti-venom anything. But no, I don't think that, um, that my job is any more dangerous than anything else. And uh, without question, uh, one of the largest dangers that I face is driving to sites far away, going to Uppington and going down to the, the Eastern Cape to do training and uh, facing other motorists on our roads. It's quite a bit of danger involved, but it's very seldomly got to do with the snake. Um, you know, things like having a vehicle that's stopped on the side of a freeway because the people were driving and all of a sudden there was a snake coming out the dashboard or the, the vent or something. And that car has literally stopped on the freeway and I've had it before. I've actually had a big, a big truck stopped in the middle of the N3. Um, and then being called to go and find the snake um, and you've got traffic rushing past you because the police haven't arrived there yet to slow down traffic and things like that. Um, so there's always elements of danger, um, climbing high up into trees where you could potentially fall and kill yourself or break every bone in your body. Um, yeah, so it's not normally the snakes that are the danger part. Uh, it's the, the circumstances that the snakes are in. They might be in a DV board, an electrical DV board. And you know that if you put your hand in the wrong place, you're going to get electrocuted. Or if you've 
manage to get your hand on the snake and he touches something live, he's going to get electrocuted along with you. Um, things like that. Um, otherwise, the only time the snakes become a, a issue if they are dangerous snakes and the situation is a bit dicey is when you've got a snake, for instance, like in a ceiling, a really big black mamba in a ceiling where your mobility is restricted. You can only step and put your weight in certain places, otherwise you're gonna fall through the roof. It's not like you can just jump out the way quickly. It's not like you can just back up, you know? If, that, if you've cornered that snake and he's got no other option but to come at you, you can't get out the way, so. There's a bit of danger involved, but uh, that's what makes it so exciting. <laughs> um, snake catching is definitely a risky job, but I definitely don't think it's the most dangerous. That has to go to policemen. They definitely have the most dangerous job, dealing with people with guns and knives. People are way more dangerous than snakes. The most dangerous yeah, aspect of my job, I suppose, is catching black mambas like, in tight spaces like ceilings. I've done that a few Whoa. times recently, and in tight spaces. That if something goes wrong, then you're going to have to rush to hospital. Um, but also, sometimes you go to rescue snakes in really dodgy areas where there's some really unfriendly people. So that's probably also just as dangerous. Uh, another dangerous part of what I do is driving late at night, especially when there's a call on at 10, 12 o'clock on a Friday or Saturday night, and you do see a lot of drunk people on the roads. Working with venomous snakes does involve a level of danger. I have been bitten before, um, but um, not very often. Um, I think that the important thing about working with venomous snakes is that you have protocols. And you don't handle a snake when it's not absolutely necessary. And for example, nowadays we very, very rarely will hold a snake behind its head. So we use tubes for controlling the snake's movements. We use grab sticks for moving them from one cage to another. We've got appropriate buckets and other containers that are um, suitable for putting snakes into at very low um, levels of danger. So I think all in all, if you stick to those rules, it's possible to handle venomous snakes on a routine basis uh, without much chance of or much risk of being bitten. Interestingly and ironically, the most dangerous aspect of my job is not the arrival at the call out and catching the snake, is not the catching of the snake, it's not necessarily even the bagging of the snake, although these parts uh, are, all have their dangers involved. To my mind, I drive probably around five to seven thousand kilometers a month servicing my, my community and my area, and the chances of having an accident over that period of time, or over that distance traveled rather, is probably far more dangerous than any snake that I have to catch. Dealing with traffic, dealing with difficult situations, and on the road for most of my day. That is the most dangerous aspect of my job. The most dangerous aspect that I face on a daily basis is when we have to remove a problem snake. Often you arrive in a situation where the snake has already been injured or the snake has had um, some sort of fluid thrown on it, um, it's been sprayed by some insecticide and the snake does not behave the way it normally does. Now, to normally, to find a snake in the bush, you know what they would do normally. In these situations, because it's not normal, uh, you're sitting with a much higher risk of actually being bitten and you have people next to you, behind you, you've got animals bothering you, you don't have a clear area and the snake doesn't have a place to escape. So the snake is already in defense mode. And if the snake then attacks and bites you, he doesn't know that you're there to help him. The snake thinks that you are there to prey on him. That is why he's been cornered. So if you get a bite in those sort of situations, they're usually a lot worse than if you stumble across a snake in the bush and get an accidental bite. Now, because snakes can regulate the amount of venom that they give off, normally they don't give off that much that it's a serious bite, but in these sort of situations, they're fighting for their life, so they'll give whatever venom they have. One of the things that we do is we set traps for herpetofauna, and we often catch very venomous snakes um, in these traps. And we'll need to remove the snakes carefully from the trap, and during that whole process of handling the animal, it is obviously much more dangerous than not handling a venomous snake. And then we need to take a good photograph of the animal, which it also has its, its risks. So just just by having to handle venomous snakes, even um, from the trapping scenario, 
makes my job a bit more dangerous than I'd say a normal office job. All right, so the most dangerous things about going to a snake removal site is my mom taking me there, that's quite scary. And then second all, it's the people's reaction on the snake removal site. The actual handling of the snake is less dangerous than the previous two things I've mentioned. In the next episode of Snake Heroes, we will find out more about snake handling protocols used by our snake heroes and debunk many myths and fallacies about using snake tongs and what really happens to snakes when they are released back into the wild.